everybody we're going to go ahead and get started so we can get as much of the full hour in here as we can so um, once again we have Dr. Albanese with us and he is going to present what is it think well be well think well be well <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Albanese and we're very happy to have him with us again thank you is that a good uh, volume okay I'm naturally a loud person so I can't put this too close to me try that there as long as my stomach doesn't rumble we're okay okay well today's topic is and I've noticed pretty much all the faces so I won't go into the whole who I am thing but um, today's topic is think well be well so when I start out in this talk I like to ask two questions before we start out so by a show of hands who here thinks they can be healthier or knows they can be healthier than they are now okay by a show of hands, is there something that you know can help you be healthier that, you're, that, that you can be doing now that you choose not to? Okay, good. So why aren't we doing these things? We, we want to be healthier, and we know there's something I could be doing that could produce better health, but I don't do it. Why is that? Not enough hours in the day? Okay. But if you had a severe health crisis, you would find hours, wouldn't you? I think we don't do these things because we're comfortable. You know, overall, we're comfortable with where we are. It's not too bad. You know, we hear things like, well, you know, I'd like to do this. Well, I should do that. Um, I ought to do this. I need to find time for that. That's not real motivating. You know, I am definitely going to start that tomorrow morning, and this is what I'm going to do, and this is my plan. That's a little more conviction. But if we're comfortable, how, how bad do we really want to change? Right? So my job today is to make you uncomfortable. That's my job. <laughs> my job is to make you uncomfortable and uneasy with where you currently are. Because if I come up here and pat you on the back and, well, you can do some of these things, that would be kind of cool. You know, these are nice things that you can change or uh, add to your current health regime. Well, I'm really not that motivated to do it. But if I stand here and tell you that your life depended on it, which it does, you would probably look to say, well, I could probably find some hours. I can probably do some of these things. I can probably do all of these things. So my job today is to help you become uncomfortable. Okay. The reason for that, and I've mentioned these things in the past, but I'm going to say it again. Number one cause of death is heart disease. They say that 90% of the heart disease is preventable if better lifestyle choices are made. Second cause of death is cancer. American Cancer Institute says that conservatively, with their uh, information, 60% of the cancers are preventable if better lifestyle choices are made. And we have strokes, lung disease, uh, accidents, diabetes. These are some of the top causes of death. All of which, for the most part, are lifestyle induced. So I want to make you uncomfortable because I don't want that to be the reason why you're unhealthy. See, why is it that our average lifespan in the United States is 77.6 years old? To me, that's not old especially as I'm 44, <laughs> right? And that number over the next 40 years by 2050 is decreasing, they say, five years to 72 years old. So do the math. How old will your kids be when you're 72? How old will your husband be, your wife, your friends? Okay, if we buy into those statistics, right, which are representative of our whole country, I'm not saying that's you, but how old will your family be? My kids won't even be my age, and they'll be fatherless. To me, that's not acceptable. That makes me uncomfortable. That's why I'm doing this talk. Think well, be well. I'm going to share with you today how your emotional mindset, your, your, your mental emotional mindset and health can have an impact on how long you live. Not only will it have adverse 
effects on your health, but how long you live. So I want to help you bring that number of 72 up so you're on the other side of 72 so that average increases. That's what my goal is for people. Because there's no reason why we shouldn't be... Uh, I just read yesterday, or I saw a little, little picture of Jack Lane. He passed away. Yeah, I, I want to read his little article. Um, because I want, you know, here's a guy who really lived, right? And, and it's funny because I see the reruns of him on one of the ESPN shows in those black tights and standing behind the chair. He was so far ahead of his time. You know, he's got the juicer and all. He's been doing that for decades. Now it's become the Vogue thing to do. You know, the juicing and, and, the, and you know, eating healthy. Really looking at food differently. So, our thoughts. See, we all want to, especially in January, right? We all, it was interesting. I talked to a lady uh, sometime at the end of the year, uh, sometime in December. She said, oh, I can't wait for January to come. I said, well, why? She goes, well, because... My, everything's going to change. It's going to be great. It's going to be a great new year. I said, well, that's great. I said, what's going to, oh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start getting in better shape and, and so on and so, you know, all the things that we say every year. Eat better, lose weight, get in shape, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I looked at her, I said, well, why are you waiting? Why is, what does January 1st really mean? It's just a number. Why not June 1st? Why not today? See, to me, she wasn't really motivated. She was caught up in that January 1st, everything will change. I go to the gym this morning, I get there at about quarter of six in the morning, parking lot's packed. I know there's going to be a different parking lot. They're going to add spaces uh, come March and April because it won't look as full. I'm sure the same number of people will be there, but it won't look as full, right? I mean, most of the people that are there now, I know. They're not going to be there in a few months. Why is that? See, we all want, we all want to have, you know, better shape or better diet or better this or we all want to we all want to achieve some type of goal so what do we do we start doing things we join a gym we go on a diet you know I always think it's interesting the the um, New Year's resolution I want to be more punctual so what do we do well what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn my clocks 15 minutes ahead so I'm always on time right we start doing things so we want to have the result so we start doing things but why is it when we do these things, they don't last? See, why is that? There's a very simple principle. It's called be, do, have. We want to have things, or accomplish things, reach goals. So we are doing certain things. Action steps. But there's a reason why those action steps don't last a long time. It's the first part of the equation. Because we are not being. Be, do, have. See, in order for, for our New Year's resolutions, our goals to take hold and last, you have to have a belief system that is congruent with what your goal is. Because if your goal is uh, to join the gym and get in shape, right? But you tell me you really don't like going to the gym. The only time you can go is first thing in the morning. Uh, but you're not a morning person. You know, if that's what your goal is, but this is your belief, I don't like waking up, I really don't like being around all those people when I exercise, are you going to really see that goal come about? Now, you might gain a little momentum, but you're going to lose a lot of momentum and be one of those people that don't go to the gym after a few months. Right? Because your belief system is not congruent with what your goal is. Now, your belief system is how you see the world. It's how you see the world, how you interpret the world, and how you respond to the world. Your beliefs. Most people are caught up in the do's and the has, but your beliefs is the most important part of the equation. Our belief system is how you see the world and how you interpret the world. The world is not being expressed the way it actually is taking place. Events, circumstances, it's how you interpret them. Give you an example. If there was a, a crime or an accident that took place right now, okay, and the police came and they start writing down everybody's individual accounts of what happened, they would all be a little different. Uh, six foot tall. I was about five ten. Facial hair. Well, I think he had a goatee or a mustache, but I think that's it. No, he had a full beard. Hair was down to here. Well, he had semi long hair. I know it was past his ear. Everyone's account would be a little different. You take a husband and wife. 
They walk through the mall, hand in hand. Right? The husband is a, an executive, a right, business person. The, the, the wife is a homemaker. They walk through that mall, and she's going to see the toy store, the maternity store, the craft store. He's going to take a look at the briefcase store, you know, office supply store, the, uh, the tailor and the, the suits, right? She's not going to see any of that. He's not going to see any of that, although it's all there. And she's going to say, didn't you see all those stories? No, I never saw that. See, he was interpreting his world the way his beliefs were, bringing him down a path of seeing the world based on his beliefs. See, your beliefs are very powerful. It's how you see the world and how you respond to it. So how do beliefs come about? A lot of beliefs start when we're young, when we're very little. We hear things like, don't be too big for your britches. You know, woman's place is in the home. I mentioned some of these at past talks. Boys, you know, men don't cry. You know, uh, some strong beliefs. I know he loves me. That's why he hits me. Everyone I love leaves me. Those are very powerful beliefs, aren't they? They start to shape the way we live. They start to shape the way we respond to the world. I'm not going to get close to anyone. Not going to develop a real strong relationship with anyone because I know they're going to leave. Okay? Those are pretty empowering beliefs, positively or negatively. You know, young child, I brought my son to the uh, baseball cages, right? The hitting, the batting thing. And uh, now this was um, sometime in the fall. He played baseball for the first time this year or last year. So. His baseball season ended, I don't know, around May or June or something in the summer. So he hadn't been, he, he hadn't hit a ball, held a bat for about five or six months at that point. But he said to me, Daddy, I want to go to the batting cages. All right, cool, let's go. You know, so I took both the boys and we went there. And I think it's 20 balls for, I don't know how much, maybe a dollar or a couple dollars or something like that. Well, I know because I know how much money I gained. We... Uh, he tried to hit 100 balls that day. He did not even foul tip one ball. He hadn't done it in months. Now, when we went back in the spring, in the summer, when we would go every, you know, maybe every week, every couple weeks, he was, Daddy, I'm going to hit it over the cage. I'm going to hit it. Great. Oh, that's probably a home run, Mike. Oh, that's definitely a triple. Oh, I can see. You know, I'd make up these little scenarios, right? He's excited. So he got up there. He swung. I said, that's all right. Put the, other, put the next token in. 20 more balls. And I, and I started just praying. I said, please, just let him even foul tip a ball. You know, he was getting frustrated. And, and I understood why, right? He, but, see, he hadn't done it in a long time. So I was trying to encourage him. That's all right, Michael. Man, you swung that bat. I think my hair blew back. You know, I started making scenarios up about that. You know, uh, and I'd tell his little brother, fall down. Hey, why? Fall down. Look, you swung so hard. You knocked Matthew down with that wind. You know, so he started lightening up a little bit. But... If I hadn't done that, boy, he could have left there very frustrated and said, I never want to play baseball again. Baseball stinks. I can't hit. I'm a bad hitter. You know, so it turned out to be a pretty good day. And then, of course, Daddy took him for ice cream and all the other stuff that was helpful in, in changing that scenario. But the point is, that's a belief system that starts. See, he wasn't bad at baseball. He just didn't do it for a while. See, how he interpreted that event was, at that point, because he's a young child, had a lot to do with how I interpreted that event. So your belief system, your belief system starts when we're young kids, and then we build on that as we get older. The problem is our belief system comes from so much stuff outside of us. Very little of it comes from in here. You know, you watch TV. Ooh, I have to buy that type of car. You know, I should wear that outfit. I should look like that. Right? Open up magazines. You know, there's billions of dollars spent on marketing. Everybody would like to tell you what your belief system should be. Right? There's plenty of people that will tell you. That's, that's the problem with our beliefs. We don't really understand where they come from. All of a sudden, we're, uh, we're, we, we are where we are in life, and we don't even know how we got here. Right? So your belief system. This is why your belief system is very important when it comes to your health. It's how you interpret and respond to the world. Now, once you start thinking of a certain way, you start repeating that thought process. 
I'm going to get technical for a minute because I want you to understand this very, it's a very important principle. The way you see things, your brain starts to process it. So your brain takes in this information and that information goes through little junction boxes, if you will, little parts of your brain. There's something called your prefrontal cortex. It's where your emotions are. Uh, you, you start to decipher emotions, happy, sad, things like that. Well, you take in this information and happy things, positive things, joy, love, those things, positive, go down a path okay, in your prefrontal cortex. The left prefrontal cortex processes all those happy things, positive things. Okay? What happens then? You start to secrete serotonin. Your brain releases serotonin. That's the happy chemical, the feel-good chemical. When that happens, it inhibits or decreases the amount of a chemical okay, that produces negative emotions. Neuroadrenaline is what it's called. It's not important. Okay? Serotonin is increased. Now, when there's something that's stressful, something that causes anxiety, fear, hate, something negative, that goes down a different path. Okay? It goes down the right prefrontal cortex. And as soon as that happens, it starts a chain of events. Now, the left side is what I call the loosey-goosey side. When I was going through school, I had to think of ways to remember all this stuff. The loosey-goosey side. The right, rough and rigid. Okay? Now, stress. Healthy, unhealthy, good, bad, what would you say? Stress. Not good? Some is good? Healthy? Okay. So you're all right. Okay. Stress is good. Right. Going back to... Uh, Years ago, you know, when we would come out of our cave, when we lived in caves, you'd see a tiger there. Okay? And what do you do when you see that tiger? Fight or flight? Okay, you can say, well, I'm going to eye it up, see if I can take this thing. No, I can't. I'm out of here. Okay, stress. It keeps us alive. Right? As soon as you're out of that stressful environment, that life-threatening situation, stress levels decrease, you go back to a state of homeostasis, everything is great. Right? Now, what happens with stress in that type scenario? Okay. Your body changes physiologically. You go through different chemical changes. What, should you, what would be good to have uh, on hand in a stressful situation like that? Well, I'd like a lot of energy, right? Because if I'm going to have to defend myself or I'm going to have to flight, if I'm going to have to get out, I want my muscles to contract. I want a lot of energy. Uh, my heart rate is going to increase, right? My respiration is going to increase. You're going to need more blood, you need a lot more oxygen because your body's preparing for fight or flight. So, let me go down through a list of reactions that take place with regards to stress. A stressful situation, in other words, a life-threatening situation. Your body takes in that information, it goes down the right side of your brain. Serotonin is inhibited. There's no happy chemical now. Noradrenaline is increased. That starts a, a chain of reactions. The part of your brain called your amygdala, okay, starts to go through its memory banks and says, is this stressful? What do I do? So in that kind of situation, you don't need logical thought. Okay? You don't need an analytical thought process. You don't need um, a lot of concentration. You need emotion. Okay? Your fire alarm ever go off in the middle of the night or alarm system in the middle of the night, you get up and you can't even think. You're, you're, oh, what do I do? What do I, it takes you a second or two to just, oh, I have to calm down. Let, let me think what I have to do. Right? That's what happens in a flight, fight or flight response. You go into an emotional response. Okay? Strictly emotion. Now, the chemical reactions that take place because of energy and things like that, well, first your body says, we need fast energy. Well, you're not going to burn fat. It takes a long time. What about sugar? Good source of fast energy. So your body says, okay, let's start a chemical reaction. Let's take the sugar, the glucose, out of my liver and start dispersing it through the blood. Give all the muscles and tissues a lot of energy. Right? Now, when that happens, your pancreas says, oh, wait a minute, we need to get that, that glucose. So your pancreas produces more insulin. And the insulin goes down and tries to chase down all the glucose, all the sugar. Okay? Now, what also happens is magnesium is decreased. And I'm going to tell you why this is important. I'm going through all these reactions. Magnesium is decreased. Magnesium, when it's increased, causes muscles to relax. 
So when, muscle de when magnesium decreases, muscles don't relax. They stay tight, fight or flight. You want to be able to contract your muscles. Blood vessels are also a muscle. They constrict, right? Increases blood pressure. Now what also happens, your body has to get ready for this fight or flight response where there may be an injury, okay? There may be an injury. So how do we start getting ready for that? Well, you start to produce this inflammatory response within the body, just in case an injury happens and there's inflammation that ensues. So what do you need for that? Well, cholesterol is important for that, wound healing. So let's take some of the HDLs out of the blood. Let's get them ready for this uh, inflammatory and, and injury type situation. So now you take the HDLs, you take them out of the blood. Well, at least leave the LDLs. They can't help us. Those are the bad cholesterol, right? What else happens? Uh, we don't need our immune system to function at that point. We're not looking for healing, crisis, not healing. So immune system is suppressed. You don't need digestion at that point. You're not going to eat food, right? So digestion slows down. Your digestive tract, peristalsis, the contraction of the muscles within your GI tract, which moves food. We don't need that. Muscles tighten up, right? Remember I said magnesium is decreased, so muscles will tighten up. So your GI tract tightens up. The only process within your GI tract that is stimulated is acid production in the stomach because this is called a sympathetic response. So your sympathetic nervous system is kicked up. So acid is produced, but your whole system is slowed down. Um, what else happens? Uh, well, we're not going to need our sexual function at that point, right? So sexual function is suppressed. pH levels change within our body. Our whole body chemistry changes, our blood chemistry. You become more acidic. Stress response produces more acidity. Now, that's what happens in a very acute fight or flight stress response, okay? They're all purposeful reactions. They are all based on your body's response to stress. Okay, does that all make sense? Why those things happen? Now, do not raise your hands. People say they have stressful jobs. How long do you work? For decades. People say they have stressful lives. Okay, how long are you going to be part of your own life? For decades. <laughs> For years. Right? So now we live in a stressful life. Stress is no longer an event. It's no longer an accident that happens. I have to respond real quickly, then that's over with. I can go back to being happy and blissful. No, we live with stress. Stress becomes part of who we are. That person is just stressed out. Um, a bundle of nerves. We hear these things. We develop descriptive terms and we laugh about them. Now what happens in this stressful life that we have? Our body starts to process things in a habitual pattern. You start to take in information and go left or go right. Now, you ever get in your car and go to work and take a different road than the one that you take five days a week? Doesn't it feel weird when you do that? And you might have in your mind, okay, I have to pick up something before I go to work. I'm going to go to that store. Well, you're halfway to work. You pass the store and you, oh, I forgot to stop. You backtrack because you just become sensitized to the way you always go. You don't even, if I were to ask you, what was on the side of the road today? I have no idea. I don't even know half of the things I pass in the morning because I'm, I'm just on this path. I just get used to going on it. I make sure that I don't crash. I make sure the cars don't crash into me. And that's really all I'm thinking about when I'm driving. Right? That's the way your brain works. You start processing things the way you've always processed things. Your brain, there's something called neuroplasticity. Neuro, nervous system, your brain. Plasticity, you mold it. You start to shape your brain right, into processing things the way it always processes them. Left side, right side. Right? So where are you? What road are you on? Left side or right side? Oh, that person's always so happy no matter what happens. They, they always find the good in things. Oh, she is so stressful. I can't even be around her. Right? Somebody walks into a room. Oh, I can feel the stress they bring. Right? Start to process the world. Now, what happens when you do that over time? Well, when you have a stressful life, stressful job, when you have chronic stress in your life, this is what happens. Well, we become emotional. 
because we're not logically thinking about things. We base our thoughts on emotion because that's what we do with stress, right? We start to lose our short-term memory. Can't remember things. Can't put things in place. Can't put my finger on it, right? Because you're dealing with just being emotional. Now, what happens in your body? Well, heart rate increases, right? Because we need more blood pumped all over our body for this fight or flight response. So years of that, what happens? Something called maybe high blood pressure, right? We need a lot of energy, right? So what happens? Then take the glucose, filter it through the blood. We don't make enough insulin to keep up with the glucose. Does that sound like insulin dependent type two diabetes? We're gonna take the HDLs, leave the LDLs, take the HDLs out of the blood, right? For wound healing. We also partly convert that to amino acids in the liver and for glucose too. But we're gonna take the HDLs out. We're gonna leave the LDLs in there. Does that sound like high cholesterol? Okay. Now, magnesium decreases, muscles stay tight. Anybody have knots they can't get rid of? Tightness in the muscles, not to mention a blood vessel, like I said, is a muscle, so it stays constricted. Okay, trigger points, muscle tension. Now, what also happens in this fight or flight response when insulin increases, causes a reaction to say, we don't need calcium. Take the calcium out of bone and excrete it in urine. Okay? Does that sound like osteoporosis? Where else is calcium found? What bone? Teeth? Does that sound like tooth decay? When you go from a neutral to a very acidic state, okay, acid basically erodes things, okay, tooth decay. Now, when your body is naturally acidic, or not naturally when, you, when that environment changes and you become acidic, do you think you want acid floating around organs that are very important to keep you alive? No. You want to somehow build a wall up around your organs so that acid doesn't uh, erode those organs, right? Like it would the inside of the stomach, ulcers. So let's, let's put fat around here. Let's put fat around our organs to protect them from the acid. Why is it people go on a diet, they change things, but they can't lose that weight? Where they get to a certain point, no more weight loss. You can't lose it, especially if you're stressful, because your body can't lose it because it's protecting the organs. What else changes? Uh, well, your GI function. You produce more acid, burning, heartburn, ulcers. But yet, your whole GI tract doesn't move very fast. Slows down. Right? I-T-I-S at the end of a word means inflammation. Have you ever heard of colitis? Diverticulitis? Irritable bowel syndrome? Right? Food doesn't move. Constipation, bloating. Well, if you're eating food and you're constantly stressed, but yet your GI tract says, oh, we're going in first gear today. Food's not going to move through. It's going to sit there. Okay? Now we have all these gastrointestinal problems. Sexual function is decreased. I have no sex drive. Right? Now we have a, a whole condition you know, that we name for those problems. Immune system, suppressed. We don't need our immune function when we're stressed. So it decreases. Does anybody think it's interesting when flu season comes about? Flu season is a season now, right? Summer, spring, winter, fall, flu. Those are the five seasons. Why is that flu season in the fall, in the beginning of the year, and not in the middle of July? Are stress levels different the end of the year as opposed to July? Anybody get sick in July? No. Everybody's happy. Sun's out. We feel good. What happens at the end of the year? Well, Thanksgiving starts the beginning of flu season. Okay. Why is that? Well, what do we do? We sit down, we have this big meal. Okay. And all that food. And we pile it on. Then we have cakes and cookies. All the sugar. That produces more acid. It causes your pH to decrease. Right? Then we have Christmas. We have big meals. Go to every family. I'm Italian, so. Go to every family. Right? Everybody in your family. Big meals. Cookies, cakes, sugars. Right? Increases acidity, stresses your body. Not to mention our stress levels increase. Year end, right? Holiday shopping. So you create the perfect environment for what? To get sick. Plus your immune system decreases when there's stress. So you have no defense and you're piling up your body with stuff that is toxic, right? And why do we get sick? Because we produce that. It's not flu season. 
Flu season could be any time. But flu season in every country, every country is when there's more stress. The end of the year around the holidays. Our whole lifestyle changes. So we live in chronic stress. And we wonder high blood pressure, diabetes, osteoporosis, 2TK, uh, increase in weight, uh, osteoporosis. We have all these conditions. It's not genes. Because I've had people tell me this. Well, what about genes? You know, my mom has this, my father has this, so-and-so has this. Genes do not cause you to be sick, no matter how sick your family members were. You may have uh, the genes from your family that have the potential to cause those conditions, but you have to turn those genes on. They have to be enabled. You have to have an environment that says, Gene, express yourself. If you don't have that environment, that gene will not be turned on. Genes don't cause us to be sick. What causes us to be sick is poor lifestyle. If it was genes, then a child that every relative had high blood pressure would have high blood pressure at day one. Why does it take a gene 40, 50, or even 60 years to start producing high blood pressure if it's a gene? Because you have to create a toxic environment over decades that now that gene says, well, now I'm ready. This is the stuff I've been waiting for. We got to my threshold. Now I'm ready to express myself. That's why genes make us sick. The genes themselves don't make us sick. Now, are there certain genetic problems and things like that? Yes, but the vast majority of cases. Now what do we do? Okay. Now we have all these conditions. So we start treating them, don't we? Find somebody who's 60, 70 years old, 80 years old on high blood pressure medication. I guarantee you, I can almost guarantee you, they're also on diabetic medication, high cholesterol medication. The women are on Topamax or some type of osteoporotic medication. Uh, then we become emotional and all this kind of stuff. We don't think right. right? You get depressed. You don't think right. Number one drug, antidepressants. Right? And we wonder why people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, on the average, are on 13 different medications. This does not happen as just a rite of passage as you get older, right? This is a chronological uh, happening. Uh, not a chron but, but a, 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 something that has developed over years right? due to poor lifestyle. And then we treat people for that. Now understand why the blood pressure went up, why the glucose, you know, why the sugar went up, why the calcium uh, is excreted in urine. Understand why that all happens. Because of stress. Stress response to keep us alive, right? So now we start treating and we say artificially let's take this blood pressure medication to decrease blood pressure. What is your body going to do? Increase blood pressure. We're increasing blood pressure for a reason. As a physiological response to stress. And now we try to bring it down. Ask anybody if they've been on high blood pressure medication when they get off. They don't. They stay on for life unless they radically change their lifestyle. Come off the medication, blood pressure went up. Eventually, the blood pressure medication doesn't work the way it used to, so we have to give new ones. This medication doesn't work the way, let's give a new one. Why? Because your body is saying, we need the blood pressure up. We need the glucose up. We need all these things to happen. It's a proper response to stress. But we see it as a condition, and we treat that condition. Meanwhile, we leave the ultimate underlying cause left uncorrected, and we have a sick society. And that starts with your thought process. There are other essentials to health, a lot of which I've talked about in the past. You know, exercise, nutrition, uh, rest and sleep, your nervous system. All these things happen with all different types of poor lifestyle choices. Thinking well can definitely stop those things from happening or decrease those things from happening based on obviously your other lifestyle choices. But just your thought process can bring those things about. So when you say, think positive, I'm going to think positive this year. Why? Because it keeps you alive. We say, oh, think positive. Feel better. Yeah, you'll feel better, but you'll be better. If you start to change your belief system and understand what positive and negative thought processes can actually do to you, hmm, now I have a little bit of a motivating reason to change my thought process, don't I? 
See, if I didn't go through all that, I can say, well, affirmations and goals and thought pro- you know, positive thinking, that's all great. It's more than positive thinking. Positive thinking, I can think positive and still be very sick. Right? It's having a healthy thought process. Thinking well. Not just being positive. That's important, but thinking well. See, we all want the have. The destination. Right? Ask a 12-year-old, what is it like to be 12? It's great. One more year. Why? I'll be 13. You have a 20-year-old. One more year. Be 21. 64. One more year. Finally get to do whatever I want. Right? We're all waiting for that destination, but the problem is that destination isn't what it's all about. See, life is not a destination. It's a journey. It's a journey. It's not about being perfect. It's about making improvements. We're never going to be perfect. Well, I won't get into me. But anyway, but we're never going to be perfect. Right? But it's about improving. Right? So we can improve on where we are. You start to change your lifestyle. They say about three years, you change your whole physiology. You see this on like Dr. Oz now. You ever see Dr. Oz where they take the age of someone? I'm 49 years old. Okay, 49 chronologically, but your heart's 72. Your liver is this, this and this, right? Because of the toxicity that's built up. Then what do they do? They radically change their lifestyle, don't they? They start exercising, they start eating better, and this and this and this. And all of a sudden those numbers start coming down more in line with their chronological age. You can change that. Now, it starts with your thought process. See, all of those people didn't just go on a diet. They saw they were dying. That gave them a sense of being uncomfortable, uneasy. I was watching this show. I don't know how I started watching it, this um, uh, celebrity rehab with Dr. Drew. And they were sitting there in front of this kid. Uh, I don't know who he is. He's like a billionaire son or something, right? And uh, I think he's in his 20s, maybe, late 20s something like that, they said his body was that of an 86-year-old. And they were trying to help him. Now his was probably all these lifestyle things, but also drugs, obviously. Right? But they said, if you don't stop doing drugs, you're going to die. And that wasn't like a cool, uh, not a cool, but, but a way to motivate him. That was a reality. Your body is 60 years older than you are. That also can happen with thinking poorly, thinking unhealthy, right, along with the other health choices. It's not just one thing. So how do we start to change our thought process? Neuroplasticity, right? You start to think differently over time. 22 days to create a habit. So start with 22 days. Start with one day. And then two, three, four, 22 days it becomes a habit. It becomes part of your, the way you think. This is just what I do. Right? Now it starts to become a habit. So I have mentioned this before. We have 60,000 thoughts a day. Right? 40% of the things we think about never happened. 30% happened in the past. They can't be changed. 12% are illogical. 10% petty and miscellaneous. Not even worth our attention. Right? Of all the things we, we think about, 60,000 thoughts, 2% we can positively impact. 6% is going to happen. Okay, now it's your response to how it happens. Are you thinking well, even in light of those situations? Right? People see good in everything. Right? You hear that phrase, oh, sees good in everything. That's a healthy thought process. Because things are going to happen. Things that we see as you know, sad or whatever it is. But how do you respond? See? So how do you respond? So... We start to change the way we think and see the world. We start to change our whole body. One of the best ways to start that is by creating a mission statement for yourself. Define who you are. See, the world is already doing that, actively and passively. You know, my sister um, used to work for Merck Pharmaceutical in marketing. They spend more money on marketing drug companies as a whole, spend more money on marketing than they do research and development. For me, that's reason enough not to take a drug. <laughs> if they put more money into the advertisements than they are the research of the drug that they're advertising, that, to me, that, that's like, the, mm, that doesn't add up, right? But advertisers, they'll spend a lot of money. That's 
That's why they choose celebrities. We want to dress like them. We want to be like them. We want to live their lives, right? So let's get them to sell products. But when I was uh, read an article a long time ago, Michael Jackson didn't even drink Pepsi. <laughs> but yet they paid him millions of dollars to sell Pepsi to you. And you know what? More people drank Pepsi just because they associate Michael Jackson and Pepsi together, right? So start to create a mission statement for who you are. And we weren't just plopped down here for a period of time you know, to consume some, some of the air, right? walk on the earth, and then go somewhere else. You're here for a reason. What is that reason? What is that purpose? Figure out why you're here. Create a mission for your life. Who am I? What do I want to accomplish? What do I stand for? Base it on your values, your core values. Right? Then you create a mission statement. From there you say, well, based on, I'll give you an example, my mission statement for me as a professional is to read, research, educate, and adjust. Adjust is what I do in the office, chiropractic adjustments. Read, research, educate, and adjust. Four things I need to focus on. That's it. That's how simple my life is when I'm in the office. Am I reading, researching, educating, and adjusting? That's it. Anything else? Sorry, I can't be bothered with that. So for me, it's very simple. Four words defines who I am, my purpose as a professional. Right? So it doesn't have to be a long, drawn-out thing. The simpler, the better, more concise and specific. Then, based on that, you say, well, what do I want to accomplish here? If this is what my talents are, this is who I am, what do I want to accomplish with my life? Set goals, personal goals. Maybe I want to buy this car. That's a great goal. Maybe I want to find inner peace. Maybe I want to be more relaxed. Maybe I want to be more punctual. I want to be more understanding. Those are goals too, right? It's not always about the stuff. The stuff is usually there right, to change how you feel. Right? The feeling is what's important because that's enough to produce change. Feel something. Right? The car just not the car, it's how it makes you feel. Right? Personal goals. Family goals. Set aside time each week to be with my kids. Read with them every night. Uh, do an activity individ with each individual child every week. 30 minutes. Maybe reading, maybe going for a walk, whatever it is. Uh, relationship goals. Right? Create your relationship. Most relationships are created by everything else around us. Most people have stress in their relationship, not because of the relationship, because of all the other stuff, right? The mothers and the fathers who love to voice their opinions and the neighbors and everyone. Create your relationship. Play goals, things you just want to do for fun. You know, prosperity goals. Start listening out what you want to accomplish. And then affirm that. Affirm who you are. Affirm what you want to accomplish. Affirmations. Say that to yourself. You know, I, I think I might have shared this with you before. I write my goals, my mission statement, uh, and I type them up and I laminate them. This makes it real. When you write it down and you laminate it, we laminate everything that's important. Right? Uh, Social Security, oh, better laminate it so it doesn't get messed up. License is laminated. Credit cards are hard, right? Laminate them. And you start saying, my personal goal, I'm, just, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's personal, but I am calm and relaxed in all situation, situations. I am worthy of and expect good things to happen to me. That's what I affirm to myself. When I first wake up in the morning and before I go to bed. I don't watch TV, you know, the news. and all. This is what I put in my mind. And it has my goals in there, right? All of a sudden those things start coming about. Good things start happening. Because this is the seed that I implant in my mind. So I start thinking more out of my left side than my right side. I start training my mind to take this road. It's going to feel weird in the beginning. It's like taking that right out of your street instead of the left and going to work the back way. At first it's like, oh, this is weird. Look at all this stuff. Wow, I never noticed that house. Right? You start seeing things differently. You start viewing your life differently. 
That's how change comes about. There's always stuff that is going to happen to us. Events, there's going to be people, there's going to be situations. Right? But if you have a healthy mindset and you're thinking well, and you have trained your body to do that, even in light of that stuff, you will have a healthier response to that stuff. And when I do talks, sometimes it's a big group, sometimes a small group like this. Um, and we do programs for like the customer service group or the, this group. And we talk about these things and they create an affirmation for their team. And they start their day like this. I had a lady uh, from, oddly enough, from an insurance company say to me, uh, she came in one day and uh, she said, I have borderline high blood pressure. I just got tested. You know, what kind of herbs? You know all this stuff. Can I take something for it? Herb, natural. I said, yeah, I'm sure there's something we can come up with. You know? I said, but um, what's the difference between, between taking an herb and taking uh, high blood pressure medication? She goes, well, it's natural. It's healthier. I said, well, it might be. You might not have the side effects. But are you still getting to the cause of what brought about the high blood pressure? She said, well, no. Now, I have a good relationship with this lady. I've known her for a while. I've been to her out office actually and done talks. Um, oddly enough, they always talk about, they always pick stress reduction. Um, so that kind of clued me into uh, what's going on. But I knew they were doing a lot of changes at work. I knew there was stress at work. So I said, what is your work like? She goes, oh my gosh. I said, okay, you don't even have to tell me. Uh, what's going on with your family? Oh, my mother-in-law's sick. She's living with us now. She, okay, you don't even have to tell me anymore. Right? Stress. I said, we need to change how you perceive the world, how you're responding to it. So I gave her very specific things to try, anchors, you know, uh, before she picked up the phone. Before you pick up the phone, tap the phone once. Tap in, right? It's like with wrestling or something, you know, you go into a ball game, I tap in, you know, you go into the game, tap in, get your game face on. That call can be an irate person, it's gonna go absolutely berserk, but it's not you. Right? You're not the one that's causing that person to respond like that. You're not, you didn't create the situation. So realize that beforehand. Have a better response. Don't get all keyed up about it. Uh, and we came up with little things like this. Affirmations being one of them. Right? Her blood pressure went down miraculously. Then she said, do you think this will work for my whole team? Said, well, why not? Absolutely. So she went around the office and gathered up the people that she, was, um, that she managed and she said, this is what we're going to do. And of course, some people said, oh, that sounds cool. And, and you get the eye rollers, right? But fortunately, she got everyone to get involved. And what they did was they shared key words that were triggers for everyone. Like one lady just had a newborn baby. They said his name. And that got her into a healthier state. When she was a little stressed, they would just walk up to her. I don't know what the boy's name would say, uh, Michael. Right? How's Michael doing today? What did Michael do yesterday? That would change her state. Right? Somebody else had a different trigger. You know, maybe they love boating. Hey, how's the boat? You know, uh, maybe they said something like cobalt is the name of their boat or something. Right? But they came up with triggers. So everybody on that team knew the other triggers. Right? So that changed. When they were stressed, they would just walk by. Michael. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. You know, if they look stressed out. That started to change their thought process. And it changed, she said, it changed the whole environment in which they worked in. Even the negative people, the doom and gloom people, played along, really didn't buy into it, but played along with them, but it still had a positive impact on everyone else. So, don't be perfect. Improve. Don't look for the destination. Realize you're on a journey. Whether it's what you eat, what you put in your body, what you put in your mind. If you have a deficiency or toxicity, you have ill health, sickness, and disease. If you have a sufficiency and purity, you have health. Not only with your food, with your exercise, but with your thoughts. We have 60,000 thoughts a day. Right? This happens with adjustments, too. For those of you who are under chiropractic care, same thing happens. That stress response, when your nervous system has stress on it, it will evoke the same fight or flight stress response in your brain because that's stress. But you, know, you, you feel different after you, I feel better. I just feel lightheaded or different. 
So same response. So physical stress. Emotional stress. Chemical stress. They all evoke the same stress response. So, yes, I got technical with some things, right? And went to a lot of those reactions. But it's more than just talking about positive affirmations. You know, be happy. I wanted you to understand what the effect of being happy does on your body, what the effect of being negative does to your body, being stressed, always anxious, fear, right, despair. Those things will produce negative health consequences. So hopefully this sheds some light on thinking well. Okay, thinking well, be well. That's that's a synopsis of the talk in the title. If you think well, you will be well. Or weller. <laughs> right? Because you have to look at everything that is involved with health. So I thank you. Kim has a packet of information that we're going to hand out. And uh, again, if anyone uh, would like to visit us in the office, we give you that opportunity. Uh, you bring $10 worth of food. We donate it to the food bank and we go through your exam, x-rays, and all of that to see how we can help you because the adjustments also change your mental emotional state. You've got to work on that continual thought process, but they change your physiology. They change the way your body works. Not just about pain. So, Kim has that information for you. Uh, if you have any questions, you can email me. Uh, we have our address, phone number, stuff like that. So, on our website, there's also some great links to some resources for you. Uh, some authors, DVDs, tapes, stuff like that, uh, that can be beneficial, especially if you're driving to work over a period of time. Put something in that's positive. Start putting that in, in your mind. So I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me.